Welcome to the Family Research Council. We're pleased to have you here this afternoon. Uh, many of you have already received handouts and uh, we are printing off more for those of you that have not yet received one, so uh, please bear with us in that. Um, we're excited to have a former FRC employee here. We're all, I'm all also personally excited to have a fellow Iowan here, a rare occurrence in our nation's capital, two Iowans in the same room, and uh, I'm very excited to have Teresa Wagner here. Um, Teresa is a mother, a professor, and a third-generation attorney who sued the College of Law at the University of Iowa for political discrimination based on her conservative and pro-life views. Her case, Wagner v. Jones, came before the United States Supreme Court in early 2015 and is scheduled to go to trial later this year, and I'll let her explain more. She just recently got the date of that trial. Ms. Wagner is a former legal analyst and special counsel for Family Research Council, as well as a former legislative analyst for the National Right to Life Committee. She is a graduate of St. Michael's College at the University of Toronto, as well as the University of Lyon in France, and Washington University in St. Louis. She received her JD from Iowa College of Law after completing her first year of law school in the bilingual program at McGill University in Montreal, Canada. She has taught at the Notre Dame Graduate School of Christendom College and also at George Mason University Law School, both in Virginia. Ms. Wagner is the editor of three books and the author of numerous articles, policy papers, and legal briefs, including amicus briefs filed in Stenberg v. Carhartt at both the Eighth Circuit Court of Appeals and with the United States Supreme Court. Two of her published books were collections of essays featuring authors such as Nat Hentoff, Phyllis Schlafly, Dr. James Dobson, and Father Richard John Niehaus of recent memory. Most recently, Ms. Wagner was appointed by Iowa Governor Terry Branstad to the Uniform Law Commission, where she helps draft uniform legislation to be enacted by the 50 states. She serves alongside David Walker, professor and former dean of the Drake University School of Law, and the Honorable Rosemary Sackett, judge of the Iowa Court of Appeals. Ms. Wagner lives in Iowa with her four children, Fr Fritz, Cliff, Audrey, and Louisa, and is here with us today to discuss her case, Wagner v. Jones. Please join me in welcoming Ms. Teresa Jones. Thank you, Nate. Actually, I am the Wagner in Wagner v. Jones, just so we clarify that. But thank you so profusely for everything you have done. Events like these do not just happen. I know that. There have been many emails, many photocopies, many phone calls, and I am greatly indebted to all Nate's energies and industry. I am also indebted to the inimitable Bob Morrison, who took my call a few weeks ago when I phoned to see if I could reconnect with some of my former colleagues and friends here at Family Research. Council to tell you guys a little bit about my situation. I think it will be of natural interest to you as you have just heard. I would also like to introduce to you my two handsome sons at the back of the room. My oldest on the left is Francis Joseph, we call him Fritz. On the right is John Clifford and we call him Cliff. I cannot cover everything in this talk regarding what has happened over the past eight years. So I did get a book contract where I've written up the highlights uh, and lowlights of this experience. That book uh, will be coming out later this year, and if you are interested in more information, I do think it raises great issues of public concern and public policy, and especially for the pro-life and pro-family movement. The manuscript will be on display at the back of the room on the table, and you can put your name uh, on either sheet next to Fritz or Cliff, and my publisher will get in touch with you to make sure that you can order a copy. Um, I have taken from the book uh, certain exhibits that I'm going to refer to throughout the presentation and those should be in a handout that you should have in your possession while you listen. If you don't have one, please sit next to someone who does. I do think that the exhibits bring to life uh, a lot of the uh, claims and the facts surrounding the case. And I also added some cartoons, which some a add some levity to this experience. And uh, some of it's inside baseball, but hopefully as I go through the presentation, you'll understand. Now, um, Fritz is my oldest, and he did leave for college at Iowa State in Ames, Iowa, a year and a half ago. And as a result, my second son, Cliff, and I have gotten 
closer because he's next in line and honestly he helps me run the household and Cliff came up into the kitchen one day a while ago and said to me mom God put grapes here on earth for a raisin (laughs) get it (laughs) now I am going to talk to you over the next hour about an experience that has been very painful for me, Um, even tragic in some respects. In truth, uh, my time in Iowa since I left D.C. in 2006 has been something of a bad dream that won't end. And I often think to myself, Uh, how different my life would have been if the dean of the Iowa College of Law had simply offered me this job, which would have been so easy for her to do. I was so clearly qualified. I had the qualifications specified in the job announcement. There was great need at the law school, and I was right there. But uh, she didn't do that, and my family had great need. Um, we, My husband was in the beginning of a new business. We could have used a very stable income and a reasonably comfortable position. Ironically, it provides some comfort to me to think that perhaps That's not why God put me here, that in addition to being the mother of four beautiful children, that perhaps part of his purpose was to allow me to share my story with you. And I find, uh, I try to derive some comfort from that. And even though Iowa, uh, you know, has been difficult, there have been uh, good moments seeing my children play in uh, the same baseball team and sing in concerts and dance recitals, but it has been a very hard growing experience and uh, hopefully, hopefully some good can come of that. So without further ado, let me tell you what I plan to do today. I would like to describe to you the context of the Iowa College of Law. That is the culture that prevails there. Also tell you about the factual history of the case. Secondly, I must discuss, though I won't in detail, but I must mention the role of the Iowa judges in this litigation. Uh, Every Iowa judge I have encountered has ruled against me. In some instances, I think maliciously so. And every Iowa judge has been reversed unanimously and repeatedly by the Eighth Circuit Court of Appeals. I think that speaks for itself. The third thing I'd like to cover, though I can't in any great detail, but I think you should know, that the political discrimination is truly the tip of the iceberg of wrongdoing among law schools in this country. In particular, we now have egregious financial self-dealing, what I call unjust enrichment of law professors and unjust impoverishment of law students. That is, law students are going hundreds of thousands of dollars into debt into a market where they simply are not needed and cannot find jobs. They remain unemployed and underemployed, and it is truly scandalous. I don't know if you follow any of the blogs on this topic, but if you were at all involved in this universe, you would know. The law schools are saturating the market with JDs, and so we have uh, thousands, if not uh, hundreds of thousands, of 20-somethings who have been, I think, misled and misdirected, and this is a tragic waste of human potential. The other thing is that the law schools misrepresent what they do. They do not prepare their graduates for legal practice. On some level, I think that is beneath them, and this, too, is a form of malfeasance. Finally, at the Iowa College of Law in particular, we have, I think, considerable cronyism, uh, certainly nepotism, and I think that gives you uh, a sense of the culture there. No shortage of wrongdoing, in my opinion, and I hope to prove illegal wrongdoing at that. So some of the discussion, I think, will have to be about um, possible reform and where we can go for guidance on that. So now the um, culture at the Iowa College of Law. But first, let me just clarify for you, 
as a legal matter that the issue in this case, which is to say whether a state law school can discriminate on the basis of politics against its employees, is a settled question as a matter of law. That is, it violates the First Amendment for any public employer to discriminate against its employees either in a refusal to hire or in a termination on the basis of that employee's political uh, beliefs. The only exception to that general First Amendment rule is if the position itself requires a compatibility with policy or politics such as an advisor to the president. Under those conditions, an employer surely can and probably must consider the political views of a prospective employee. The other instances where those political convictions interfere with the functioning of the employer. So if uh, someone's moral convictions are somehow disruptive to the workplace, then you also have a problem. But as a general rule, a public employer cannot discriminate against employees for their political uh, views. And so the only real question in my case is whether my political uh, affiliations and political convictions and what I consider to be moral convictions played a part in the decision not to hire me. So let's talk a little bit about the context at the Iowa College of Law. And keep in mind that Iowa is not atypical. Um, it's actually quite representative of most law schools in the country in terms of their political bent. Uh, I have worked at the Iowa College of Law now for almost 10 years. As Nate said, I am also a graduate, although I began my legal education in Canada at McGill. But I know the place very well, as anyone who's worked some um, someplace does. And I can tell you firsthand that the advocacy for abortion, euthanasia, and same-sex issues, including same-sex marriage, has been in place now for decades. This is not a news bulletin to anybody affiliated with the University of Iowa or in Iowa City. So the first handout that you have, of course, the cover is the cartoon which shows the David against all the Goliaths. I think you can figure out I'm the David. <laughs> the next uh, article was your homework. You were supposed to have read this article by Peter Berkowitz in the Wall Street Journal. So a quiz at the end of the hour. Um, the next uh, page is where we're going to start. It should be an article. Well, here's the radicalization of American legal education. So that tells you that what happens at Iowa is not at all abnormal. It's quite typical. But the next page then should be the Press Citizen uh, article, which is the Gannett newspaper in Iowa City. And you will see that it starts, newsflash, the University of Iowa tends to lean a little to the left when it comes to politics. That's tongue in cheek. So it's not a newsflash for any, anyone. Everybody knows where they stand. And you will see that in the departments that are listed, the law school is among those departments that has more than 10 faculty members. In fact, there are uh, 50 tenure track faculty members, and there only one was a registered Republican at the time uh, the facts of my case happened. There are departments with zero registered Republicans, including the history department, and actually a candidate uh, to teach in the history department uh, also complained but did not go through the court system. He used an internal grievance process. And to no one's surprise, that went nowhere, given the institution where he was trying to find relief. Um, the Iowa College of Law, though, I think has distinguished itself on the same-sex marriage question. So that would be of particular interest to Family Research Council because um, we are a strong voice in that arena. Although, ironically, my work is not focused on the same-sex marriage issues. My expertise and my focus has always been on the sanctity of human life. But obviously, they are related in ways we can't discuss in detail now. But the next uh, handout is a profile of Patricia Kane. Pat Kane uh, was hired at the Iowa College of Law shortly before I arrived, and she was hired alongside with her partner, Jean Love. They were a lesbian couple, and they made national news with this hiring decision. I believe they were on the cover of the Chronicle of Higher Education because it was the first hiring decision by a law school which decided to hire 
to lesbians as a married couple and treat them as a married couple. They were very proud of this decision to hire Professor Kane and Professor Love. Uh, the uh, Chronicle of Higher Education article was in the foyer for any law student to see upon entering the law building. I actually had Professor Kane for a professor. I did like her. And so I took a second class with her. She taught me trusts and estates and also federal taxation. Uh, it was interesting to me because when I expressed apprehension about my political record, given the documented political liberalism at the Iowa College of Law, uh, later I was told that the primary concern was that I would insert politics into the classroom. Well, Professor Kane always used the example, and this was back in the early 1990s, of Bob and Jim a homosexual couple that comes to your office in Iowa and needs estate planning advice. In fact, the Bob and Jim examples of the same-sex couple were so common that that scenario appeared on the final examination question within our federal tax exam. So um, I received uh, that comment that they were afraid that I would insert politics into the uh, classroom with a certain amount of irony. You can see also from her resume which I think is the next thing, that much of the time that faculty spend at a law schools in the country, they spend writing about their what are called scholarly interests, but I think they could also be characterized as simply their political interests. So uh, we have publications such as Litigating for Lesbian and Gay Rights, A Legal History, Lesbian Perspective, Lesbian Experience and the Risk of Essentialism, The Future of Feminist Legal Theory, taxing lesbians, and then stories from the gender garden, transsexuals and anti-discrimination law. So I don't know uh, what this looks like to you, but to me, uh, this looks as much like a political perspective as it does um, what we call a scholarly one. So I share that with you just to give you a sense of what the culture is over at the Iowa College of Law. And I emphasize the early 1990s because I do believe that Iowa wanted to be ahead of the curve on these same-sex issues. And um, this hiring decision and these publications, I think, really evidence that. So now let's get down to the particulars of my case. Uh, we left Washington, D.C. Uh, my husband worked at the Goethe Institute up on 7th Street, but we lived in Virginia. We left in 2006 so that my husband could take over his family's property management business. Uh, I had the four kids at the time, and my youngest was one. But when I got to Iowa, I did contact the law school because I had taught uh, legal writing already at George Mason University Law School in Fairfax, Virginia. And I had heard through the grapevine that the law school actually had a writing center at the at the law school right in the building. And I thought, even though I had a one-year-old who was keeping me busy, that if they were flexible with their hours, perhaps I could be of service there. I interviewed with the director of the center. Her name is Nancy Jones. And she hired me on the spot. I think that's in part because the associate dean at that time was the one Republican who was on faculty. His name is Eric Jones. And I do think that he might have put in a good word for me. But she hired me on the spot and I began working in the writing center at the law school where I remained for almost nine years. It's a recent development that I am no longer working there and if in the discussion period you want to hear the details on that we can go there. Um, while I was there uh, I discovered number one that my husband's uh, business prospects were not going well. There was a lot of family infighting about what his responsibilities would be and so that wasn't as uh, uh, rosy as we wanted it to be but I also learned that the the law school had two positions open for full-time teaching within the legal writing program. Now, if there are any attorneys uh, in the audience, or maybe I should just say uh, legal writing is a recent development within law schools. Uh, the writing of legal documents used to be done as a sort of an adjunct to the core courses. But teaching legal writing is quite time consuming and quite labor intensive. You sit down with a student and the student's draft and you talk about strategies for being persuasive you talk about word choice and this is something that the faculty didn't want to do. We'll revisit that later in the talk. 
As a result, they created a legal writing program where they hired uh, what they called full-time instructors. This was exactly the same job that I had done at George Mason University Law School. So putting the two together, that the law school had a need, that things weren't going so well financially for us, uh, Frank and I both decided that I should apply for the position. Uh, you should see the job announcement. It would be either the next page or two pages in. And you will see that the job announcement is actually quite generic. There aren't many credentials specified. It just describes the position and what the candidate is, is expected to do. But if there is a qualification enumerated in here, it would be in the middle where, and you can read along with it if you have it in your handout, prior successful law school teaching experience in these areas is strongly preferred. So on that one particular that the job description isolated, I certainly satisfied because I had had my record at George Mason University Law School from 1997 to 1999. I should also mention to you that um, in 2002, the last time I had been offered in a position of full-time employment, which was fine, you know, because I had the kids, uh, it was at the Ave Maria College of Law. So I did go through the interview process there. I don't know if you're familiar with that law school. It's relatively new. It's a Catholic law school that was originally located in Ann Arbor, Michigan, but um, then moved to Naples, Florida. I interviewed when they were in Ann Arbor. I went through the whole rigmarole, which is to say you meet with students, you get a tour of the library, a tour of the building, you give what's called a job talk. So I had some experience in this interview process. And to make a long story short, uh, though they had over 50 applicants for the position, I became one of two finalists for two openings. I'm going to repeat that. I was one of two finalists for two openings. As an aside, uh, one on-site professor whose name is Dawn Anderson and she was teaching part-time as an adjunct, she had originally applied for the opening, but because of poor student evaluations, she withdrew her application and so it left just Matt Williamson and I. Uh, Matt Williamson, and I should say, uh, I was apprehensive. I mean, I, I don't live in a bubble. I know what institution I was approaching. I know the culture there. And so I expressed my concern to the associate dean that perhaps my political convictions and affiliations would be held against me. And that became quite critical in the litigation because once uh, those in a hiring position are on notice of a potential civil rights concern, there is a heightened duty to increase vigilance vigilance and to, if necessary, if there are other red flags, to investigate. So this becomes um, something of an important fact. So the next uh, uh, slide should be my resume. Um, so you'll see that uh, Families Research, Family Research Council's name is right on here, Analyzed Law and Public Policy. My books are on here. My George Mason University School of Law teaching experience is on here, as well as my years in private practice as a trial attorney in Iowa City. And along the way in the interview process, I was told that the uh, law school would value practical experience in particular for this position because it is more practice oriented, which is to say uh, legal documents are a standard part of litigation. People have to know how to draft them and so practical experience was a plus for this position in a way that maybe it isn't a plus, I think it should be a plus, but maybe it isn't for other faculty um, positions. So that was my resume, resume. The next should be Matt Williamson's. Matt Williamson was uh, a, a young man, I don't know if he was in his 20s, in his 30s, and he and I worked actually at the Writing Center together, so I had ample occasion to get to know Matt. And uh, when you uh, are in the same room with Matt, you immediately learn all about him. He's a very compulsive talker, and his three passions are movies, um, video games, and left-wing politics. <laughs> and he will tell you that. He is a self-described, off-the-charts liberal. So let's take a look at his resume. I may have messed up here, Nate, because actually the important page for this is his publications. And I don't know if you have that. I have it on my handout. So if you can see 
see his publications. Uh, maybe you'll have it in your handout. Uh, the first thing is that they are all fiction. <laughs> they are uh, including the movie reviews, because he's an avid uh, film buff. But his movie reviews were even fictitious. So that's one thing that jumps out at you. But the other thing uh, was, Queer Studies, which appeared on the online website called Barrel House, which is a pro-homosexual uh, website, Rainbow Party, and You Are Not a Stranger Here, Book Slut. So I think you get an idea of what his type of writing was. Um, I did uh, find out later that Matt Williamson, the self-described off-the-charts liberal, had never practiced law and so had never filed a legal document with a court of law in the country, and had never taught at a law school before being hired at Iowa. He was in his first semester. So just as a prima facie matter, the difference in credentials looked quite dramatic. So he and I proceeded to have our interviews in January of 2007. Now, um, I'm uh, not the best public speaker, but I'm an experienced public speaker. It's an, uh, something I feel an obligation uh, to do. So the job talk for me was not especially challenging. It was recorded. Uh, the person in charge of the technology put a microphone on me before they record these interviews in case faculty can't be there in person and in the event they want to review what is said. So during my presentation, which was a 40-minute presentation on what I would do as a legal writing instructor, I had a mic and it was recorded and I got tremendously positive feedback. Uh, John Carlson, a friend of mine, rushed up to the podium and said I had done a great job. Uh, I want to um, back up a little bit because I see I skipped one exhibit, uh, which is kind of important to tell you a little bit about Matt Williamson. Does everybody have the email that Matt Williamson wrote to Nancy Jones? It's dated January 30th, 2007. Uh, and I don't know if it's up here. This is an email um, that Matt, as I say, he was a talker, so you knew him as soon as you spent five or ten minutes with him. If you have it in, in front of you, you can follow along. If not, I will read the salient parts. He, this was sort of a gratuitous just talking to his boss and explaining about a job interview he had. And he said uh, he had been to Santa Cruz, California. Everybody in the entire town is high. We need to keep social conservatives away from this place because it doesn't bolster the argument that merely legalizing a drug won't cause everyone to start using it 24-7. <laughs> Down in the next paragraph, he says that during the interview, all of them loved me. They're all lefty Democrats. Then down at the bottom of the page, you will see that the district attorney um, asked him some pointed questions, including what makes you really, really angry? I'm quoting now. What pisses you off? And he says, Republicans, George Bush, right-wingers. So um, this uh, part of, people can glean what they like from this email communication. Uh, it's kind of interesting when you get into evidence rules in court, the purpose for which you offer a document becomes quite important. This could have multiple purposes um, and actually was not allowed into evidence of what types of what, how the judges have been ruled. I think one thing you take away from this communication is um, the comfort level and the ease with which people express their political opinions at the law school when they're left of center. Um, I am far more discreet uh, j just because I want to be sensitive because I was a student there at one time and I felt somewhat alienated by the living room type conversation that took place as if everyone was on the same political page. So I don't have this comfort level and certainly not this uh, willing to share my political convictions with everybody level, but certainly for people who are in the same uh, left of center political position, that comfort level is there. And, and just knowing Matt's political convictions uh, is an indication of that. So let's now move back to the job talk, which is the centerpiece of the interview process, uh, which I gave on January 24th, 2007. I was recorded, and I got very positive feedback, uh, both verbal at the time of, of it and also in writing. So the next, um, the next exhibit you should see is the feedback I got from the students 
who interviewed me as the first part of the day during the breakfast. So you will see these are Anna and Ken, and the students are part of the process. At the bottom it says that they both gave me a one, which is the highest ranking that you can get as a candidate for a position. How will she be as a professor? She will make a wonderful professor. She was passionate about the writing program, et cetera, et cetera. Ken, she would make a fabulous faculty person. So my impressions that things were going well and that I was being positively received were all confirmed when I received these documents. Keep in mind that when I filed the complaint, um, I thought I had a strong claim and I didn't have access to any documents. And then when we got access to the documents, I thought I had a really strong claim. The next uh, exhibit you will see is from the only written feedback that was given at the time of my job talk from Professor Shelley Kurtz. He's an expert in estates and trusts and wills, both nationally and in Iowa. You will see that his written feedback, written within an hour of the conclusion of my job talk, was great. Let's hire her. This is the only documentation that existed regarding my job talk. But this may not surprise you. I found out two days after my job talk <clears throat> that Matt was hired, the self-described off-the-charts liberal, and I was not. At the same time, that same day that I learned um, that I was not being given the full-time position, the associate dean, the acting associate dean of the law school, emailed the dean, and for the same reasons that I discussed before about how putting people on notice is an important component of liability, and I do not have this in front of me. Do you guys have the book back there? It's on page 147 of the book. The book's not there. I don't know if you have it, so I'll just have to paraphrase. Um, John Carlson, the associate dean, emailed the dean, so we have it in writing, and he said, I don't understand the unwillingness of people to hire Teresa. Frankly, I am worried that they are refusing to hire her because of her political views and especially her activism about it. We have that in writing. And when I found that during discovery, I screamed. <laughs> That's like a gold mine. I mean, you don't get uh, usually tape recorded admissions of improper motive, but this came pretty close. This came pretty close. It was a pretty much a bullseye. Now, the law school did not just reject me outright. When the law school first gave Matt the full-time position and uh, not me, they instead said, would you consider applying for an adjunct position? Now, adjunct positions, for anyone familiar with academia, adjuncts are exploited. They're overworked and underpaid, and so obviously an adjunct position did not serve my needs because we had a considerable amount of financial duress at that time because of um, a housing situation and other things. Um, so it wasn't going to generate the income I needed, uh, but I said that yes, I would uh, consider serving as an adjunct. And then the following week, I did make inquiries about what had happened. This was so contrary to my impression after having given a successful interview the students seemed to like me, the faculty seemed to be pleased with my presentation. What, what went wrong? So after a few discussions with people, I learned that the principal opponent to my candidacy was Randall Bazanson. Randall Bazanson's profile should be in your packet. The very first paragraph about Randy Bazanson is that following his graduation from Iowa Law School, Bazanson served as a clerk of the United States Court of Appeals and to Justice Harry Blackman of the United States Supreme Court. Uh, and that, that service to Blackman was in the term, I hope Bob Morrison appreciates this, 1972 to 1973. Uh, so Roe versus Wade was issued in January of 1973. When I saw that, I fell off my chair. Uh, then I thought, well, does he write in favor of um, abortion or Roe versus Wade? And so the next thing you should see is his CV where I saw uh, the following titles, a tribute to Justice Harry A. Blackman, uh, then again, emancipation as freedom in Roe versus Wade. So I don't think I slept that well that night. 
but they were still at least having the adjunct position hanging in the balance. And I was hopeful that uh, that would come through, if nothing else, to build a profile where I could maybe get into a full-time position or even just uh, being at the university who knows what opportunities might follow. So the next uh, papers that you should have in your handout are emails from faculty members who were voting on whether or not I should be hired as an adjunct. Every single member of the Faculty Appointments Committee recommended me to become an adjunct. Uh, that decision was made in March, <clears throat> uh, I think it was the 22nd of 2007, and I was then again rejected as an adjunct, despite a unanimous faculty rec recommendation. Uh, this is somewhat curious and noteworthy because uh, not only was Dawn Anderson, who had withdrawn her application because of poor student evaluations, rehired as an adjunct, even though the job description is the same. So her claim to having successful prior law school teaching experience was very much in doubt since her class evaluations had been so poor that she was uh, deemed not eligible for the full-time position. But it was also curious because at the time I was there, this was in 2007, there was serving as an adjunct at the time uh, a man named Stephen Muller who had become an adjunct three months after graduating from law school. But I apparently wasn't as qualified as he, but he had the distinction of having been the research assistant to Randy Bizantson. So I think we get a sense of how uh, hiring decisions are made. Within two weeks of the March rejection as an adjunct, the tape recording of my interview was destroyed. And it was on the basis of the interview that the law school claimed that they uh, did not hire me, that I had flunked my interview. Now, uh, just to give you a little bit uh, more of, well, finish the story, there should be in the packet, I don't know where it is, but uh, I was at the law school still working, and by way of explanation, I am an Iowa attorney, but my license went on inactive status when I worked here in D.C. Um, licenses are very expensive and time consuming to maintain. I did not expect to return to Iowa, so it made no sense for me to keep it active and spend all our Christmas vacations in a classroom listening to a legal lecture and then dropping $500 on that. We didn't you know, have that kind of resources to do that, so I was on inactive status and I couldn't uh, look for attorney positions in Iowa City as an attorney because my license wasn't up and running. So I stayed at the law school and worked to reactivate my license. And during the spring, now, uh, one other thing you should see in your packet is a copy of a tape label. I don't know if you have that or if Nate has it. Um, the tape label shows that the normal, the destruction of the tape, tape was claimed to be an act of recycling. You will see that the default recycle period is a year. But in my case, it was two weeks. They destroyed it in two weeks. Um, in the spring of 2008, uh, Patricia Kane and Jean Love had moved on to greener pastures in California. And uh, they sent an email back to the College of Law on the occasion of the California Supreme Court having announced that same-sex marriage was a constitutional right under the California Constitution. I don't know if you have that in your packet, but in the subject line, in all capital letters, it says, we won, how sweet it is, and Patricia Kane directs that the email be given to all faculty and staff at the law school, which is just another indication of the culture um, over there. Now, with respect to um, Matt Williamson, the self-described off-the-charts liberal, I think this is uh, relevant and I guess somewhat amusing. There have been a lot of tears for this experience, but I do sometimes chuckle about this. Maybe I shouldn't. Matt uh, had a breakdown. Uh, in the 2007-2008 academic year. He uh, cracked under the pressure of a full-time teaching position and admitted to me at the end of his tenure there that he had not been qualified and he actually offered to resign in December of 2007 and asked the dean to hire me in his place. 
Uh, and he said anybody at the Writing Center would be better uh, than I am, but Teresa's interested. You can hire her, you can hire Zach, or you can hire Wanda. But the dean insisted that he complete the academic year. So in the spring of 2008, this breakdown took the form of canceling class uh, when he felt like it, including to play video games, which are one of his three passions, and also to uh, get coffee at Starbucks. I knew about this because I was working at the Writing Center and I was meeting with students who were complaining quite bitterly about the instruction that they were receiving. Keep in mind that the tuition at the Iowa College of Law is well over $20,000 a year just in tuition for in-state students and about 40 for out-of-state tuition. Um, and they were receiving this type of instruction. The next notation or exhibit you should get is uh, notes from the Associate Dean of Students at the Iowa College of Law. Her name is Karen Crane. They're handwritten notes and they're dated on March 12, 2008. I don't know if you have that in front of you. You can see the names of the students who demanded a meeting with her and demanded his resignation. You will see in the middle of the page at the beginning of the second paragraph that John Unger asked a question and Matt said in response, are you all with me? All right. So, uh, you know, there's uh, the F word, I should have prepared. That was how he responded in class to a student question. Because really, this illegal uh, wrongdoing, and I maintain it's illegal wrongdoing, of course, I'm the plaintiff. Uh, I suffered, of course, but my children also suffered, and the law students also suffered. A lot of people paid a price for this malfeasance, but the professors and the dean so far have not. Uh, this is a bad way to start off our system of justice in our law schools. Since I was there on site, and this is quite unusual for a plaintiff in an employment discrimination action to actually be there and to see how the candidate hired in your place fares. And obviously, um, that bolstered my suspicion that this had been an improper motive and a discriminatory act. Keep in mind, I really only just wanted the job. So in 2008, when all this breakdown happened, I did retain an attorney. And my hope was that just by retaining an attorney and from my years in private practice, I know this, that often things won't ever get filed. I mean, you retain an attorney, it has a gravitas to it, and people come to the table and they work something out. Litigation is expensive, it's uh, unpleasant, um, it's endless, and there are many incentives to settle before you file a complaint. The University of Iowa never came to the table. Never came to the table. Why should they? Why should they? They weren't going to pay an attorney to defend them. They had the Attorney General of Iowa. Their defense for uh, six years has been handled uh, by Iowa taxpayers. Uh, given the lack of cooperation and because I had retained an attorney and I felt confident is never the right word when you're a party in litigation, but I felt I had a strong claim, we filed my complaint on January 22nd, 2009. Never did I think that in March of 2015 that I would still be talking about this litigation. Six long years. And eight, if you include the experience, um, you know, that gave rise to the cause of action. So that brings us to what happened with the judges. Now, procedurally, um, this can get a, a little bit tedious. I think the important point um, that you need to remember is that uh, every Iowa judge I have encountered has slammed me ruled against me, as I say, sometimes maliciously so. This was uh, one of the low spots in the litigation. Um, and every Iowa judge has been reversed unanimously. There's a story about that. Um, in the first experience in March of 2010, we decided we were going to appeal. We got word of our panel. The Eighth Circuit Court of Appeals, for anybody who pays attention to the appellate courts in the country, is actually known to be the most Republican. So I'm actually in a good spot as far as that goes. But lo and behold, we get our panel. And how this works is that they designate three judges, not the full court, to hear your appeal. And then you can always ask for the entire court, which I think is 13 judges. So I had um, a Republican 
from Arkansas, a Democrat from Minnesota, and a Democrat from South Dakota. Now, the Democrat from uh, Minnesota didn't have an especially political profile, but the Democrat from South Dakota had worked for the Clinton-Gore campaign, had been head of the Democrat Party in South Dakota, and had also presided in 13 abortion matters and in 11 had ruled for the abortion side. So I said to my attorney, she has to recuse herself. And he said, well, we're not going to do that. We, we need a pro-plaintiff judge. And I said, no, no, I'm not comfortable with her. And I talk about this a little in the book, that uh, justice has to satisfy the appearance of justice and that the justice system exists primarily for the parties, although also in part for the public. <clears throat> he said, it'll be fine. I said, no, it won't. We had a fight. And I filed pro se on my own against the objections of my attorney, a motion to recuse. It was rejected within 24 hours. <clears throat> and at oral argument uh, in St. Louis, Judge Schreier was the most active judge. She asked all the questions, including the most memorable one, which was, now wait a minute. If this faculty had only one woman on it, and every woman who kept applying to teach full time got rejected, wouldn't the dean have an obligation to do something? The decision came out six months later. The majority opinion, unanimous, written for the panel, was by Karen Schreier. So there you go. There you go. Uh, as I say, I don't know if my case is an indictment of the legal system or a vindication of it. I still don't know. <clears throat> but that's the big thing that you need to remember is that uh, every Iowa judge has ruled against me. Every Iowa judge has been reversed. We were just recently in the United States Supreme Court uh, uh, where the Attorney General was asking uh, for the Eighth Circuit to be reversed. The Supreme Court said no, they sided with me, Teresa Wagner, and it is now going back to Iowa for a trial. Let's talk a little bit about um, what happened with the trial. It was kicked out in March of 2010. Karen Schreier's decision meant that it was uh, going to go to trial in 2012. I don't know, uh, you should have in your packet that we had um, a jury trial in October of that year. Uh, the news of Karen Schreier's opinion was very good news. It came in December of 2011. I am very sad to report that in February of 2012, my husband of 22 years left our family. This has been by far the most painful uh, chapter in this whole experience. Um, but everyone should realize that litigation is very stressful. There has been enormous publicity, emotional toll, financial duress, and professional instability. And some people can't handle it. And uh, after he left, I also couldn't handle it. So in truth, and this is sort of interesting, I mean, the trial was recorded. Anyone interested can see it online. It was recorded as part of a project called Cameras in Courts for the federal courts. You can go to the federal court system and see the Southern District of Iowa and see the recording. I was actually heavy, heavily medicated at the time of the trial. I think I was in what they call situational depression. It was very much a shock for me, and I was hospitalized later that year. I'm happy, relieved to report that my testimony was coherent and sensible, and I seemed to be OK. But I was uh, on the drug of choice. It's called Xanax. I do want to say that um, I don't think, as much as I am a victim of this, because of what I'm going to discuss later about the malfeasance of law schools, I know many 20-somethings who are also in considerable pain from what law schools have misled them to believe about the legal market. They're experiencing the same type of emotional duress and financial difficulty. So I'm not alone. I'm not alone. And I think that the, the focus maybe should be on the wrongdoing of the law school, obviously. 
Uh, with respect to the trial, even though we had a very difficult judge, as I say, many things could not come into evidence for what I think is no good reason, including that email to Nancy Jones. You will see from the article reprinted from the Des Moines Register that every juror in the jury believed that discrimination had occurred. We were told that the jury hung on the question of where liability ultimately lied. It had to be with the state actor because of a provision in the law under which we sued, so it had to be pinned on the dean and they were reluctant to pin it all on the dean, and so a mistrial was declared. An Iowa judge later took a verdict which we maintained was illegal because he directed the foreman to sign an unsigned verdict form. That was the question on the second appeal, which went to St. Paul, Minnesota. It's our second appeal, and which we won, again, unanimously. Okay, there's also a letter here from a juror who wrote to my attorney to explain why the jury hung on this question. So uh, we just yesterday learned of our new trial date. As I say, it feels like it never ends. The new trial date is June 22nd of 2015. And I am very much hoping, uh, because I wasn't in any emotional condition, to involve anyone else uh, during the first trial, that this next trial we can use it as a public event that can expose what I consider to be some very serious wrongdoing on the part of our legal educational institutions. I hasten to add that the state of Iowa is not like its legal establishment, politically or culturally. The state of Iowa um, has had a Republican governor for, I think it's now in his fifth or sixth term, we're going to start calling him King, <laughs> King Branstad. Uh, it's known to have a very active and committed, um, culturally conservative uh, voting base. So what happens at the law school is completely out out of sync with the population of most of the state, but my own experience is that the same could be said about the country, that the legal establishment is out of sync with um, the voting public. So um, I want to read to you a few, and because I've used the word malicious a few times, I'm just going to read to you. Uh, and keep in mind that when I filed the complaint, I thought, I think a jury will see what I see. That's all I said. I said, I think a jury will get this. I did not appreciate at the time that a judge can block you from a jury. This is called summary judgment, and I'm not going to discuss it in any length, but it's uh, discussed in the book. It's a matter of public concern. Um, we have actually a constitutional right in the Seventh Amendment to a jury trial in civil cases. I now know why. They are a check on the judge. This is what the first federal judge re uh, wrote. Wagner presents no direct evidence of wrongdoing. There is no evidence whatsoever of illegal political animus on the part of the dean. Those first part. No evidence whatsoever. No evidence whatsoever. That hurt. That hurt, given that I thought the numbers alone uh, supported me. Okay. <clears throat> now to the last part of the talk, uh, which I'm, I'm going to use largely quotations because I think sometimes people think, oh, well, this is just a political person who has a political ax to grind about the illegal wrongdoing or the wrongdoing in the financial area. As I say, the political discrimination I view as just the tip of the iceberg of wrongdoing by Americans, America's law schools. We have egregious financial self-dealing uh, misrepresentation and cronyism. And so I'm going to read a little bit from law professors themselves. So this isn't just Teresa and her little pol political acts to grind, but law professors who have admitted, admitted themselves, you see as part of the packet, a lot of law professors have admitted to First Amendment violations, to political discrimination, not just Scott Gerber, but Peter Shook. But this has to do with the broader picture of wrongdoing. Behind the flourishing facade, law schools are failing abjectly. Recent front page stories have detailed widespread dubious practices, including false reporting of LSAT and GPA scores, misleading placement, employment placement reports, and the fundamental failure to prepare graduates to enter the profession. This is a review of another book by a professor named Brian Tamanaha. 
Addressing all these problems and more in a ringing critique is renowned legal scholar Brian Tamanaha. Piece by piece, he lays out how the how and why of the crisis. The out-of-pocket cost of obtaining a law degree at many schools now approaches $200,000. The average law school graduate debt is about $100,000, the highest it has ever been, while the legal job market is the worst in decades, with the scarce jobs offering starting salaries well below what is needed to handle such a debt load. <clears throat> Another James Chen of the University of Louisville says, legal education is broken, failed, and even a corrupt enterprise. It exalts and enriches law professors at the expense of lawyers, the legal profession, and most of all, the students whose tuition dollars finance the entire scheme. These are the headlines I see. Students uh, debt saddled, cost of legal education far outpacing associate salary increases, new lawyers struggle to repay law school debt, the Eighth Circuit finds that law school debt undermined a woman's mental health. The details on that were, despite sending out more than 400 resumes, contacting Michigan alumni, participating in on-campus interviews and using legal employment co consultant Reynolds, the woman was unable to land a job as an attorney. She eventually began working as a temporary secretary. The American Bar Association, this is on the question of saturating the market, which is, of course, related to the earning capacity of graduates of law schools. The American Bar Association recently released its annual collection of jobs placement data from, two th um, from all 202 accredited law schools, and the big picture was, as expected, dreadful. Nine months after graduation, just 56% of the class of 2012 had found stable jobs in law, meaning the long-term type of employment they go to law school to get. Another headline was, job market for would-be lawyers is even bleaker than it looks. So just about 50% not finding. Um, and I won't go on, there's more where that came from. Uh, with respect to the misrepresentation, so this is the financial self-dealing. Um, actually, law professors make um, very comfortable salaries. Uh, at the back of the room, I thought I was going to have my book. I'm not sure where it got to, the bound manuscript. But there are cartoons as part of the book. I'm very uh, proud of that. One cartoon shows um, that the dean of the Iowa College of Law actually has a higher salary than the chief justice of the United States Supreme Court court. To me, this is staggering, in large part because judges have real responsibility. I mean, they make determinations such as custody, such as liberty, who goes to jail, who sits on death row and who doesn't. These are really severe consequences that a law school dean never shoulders those responsibilities. And she gets summer break, winter break, and spring break. <laughs> and she lives in Iowa. So you guys, you know, you see where I'm going with that. Um, now, the idea that, well, these graduates, there's a certain lack of sympathy on the part of the legal establishment, including the American Bar Association. Well, they knew what they were getting into. Um, well, no, they didn't, because actually they're misled by the job numbers. And also, they think that when they go to law school, they will be practice ready, that they'll be able to put out their shingle. But in point of fact, faculty members at law schools have no practical experience. Some of them haven't practiced as an attorney even for as much as a single day. It's as if you're learning to be a doctor just by reading textbooks. It's absurd. One author said in a 2007 work titled Shame on American Legal Education, so this is not coming from me, law schools appear to operate for the convenience and profit of faculty rather than the students and future clients. At nearly every law school, nearly all the students will be going into practice for at least some length of time. At the end of three years of education, they are unprepared for this transition. The result is inexcusable in light of the amount of money de and debt the students must have in order to earn a JD. I, as you heard, uh, started my legal education in Canada, so I have a little bit of an international perspective on this. First of all, in every other country other than the United States, a law degree is an undergraduate degree. It's called an LLB. 
So there's no requirement that you get a bachelor's before studying law, although as a practical matter, I'm sure some do. But in Quebec and in Ontario, uh, people did go right from uh, high school. I had one classmate in my first year class at McGill who went right from law, um, high school into law school. I mention this because of the, f the formation and the time and the expense it takes. It's gotten very long and prohibitively expensive. So the U.S. is the only one where the law degree is not an undergraduate degree. The U.S. is also the only place where a practical component is not a part of your professional formation. In Canada, the practical component is called a year of articling. I don't know what they call it in the other common law jurisdictions. But it's also interesting to me on two fronts. First, I have begun to uh, teach at the medical school because I'm a third generation attorney. So I teach in a medical school and not at the law school. And what I see at the medical school is that the bulk of their years are spent in clinical practice. If you include residency, the vast majority of their education is hands-on patient care. The very reverse is true for law students. The second reason that I think I have a little bit of a unique perspective on this is that as a third generation attorney, I've inquired about the formation of my grandfathers. My grandfathers were both lawyers and in fact, my father's father founded a law school called the Philadelphia College of Law, whose charter he sold when it relocated to New York and now it exists no more. My grandpa Hogan on my mother's side, and this is all in the book, you'll forgive me for being personal, but I think it's interesting and relevant. Uh, he never went to college, much less law school. He began to work for a downtown Rochester law firm uh, right out of high school. He clerked for four years and then was nominated to take the New York State Bar Examination and passed. That's called reading for the law. And so he had uh, what I call an apprenticeship and what I would advocate as uh, an alternative to the current system. My other grandfather uh, was in Pennsylvania and he went to Temple University Law School out of high school spent two years there, then took the Pennsylvania bar, and then became an attorney at the age of 20 or 21. So I think this is interesting because um, I see the legal education system imploding. I think it's interesting to bring the perspective of other countries, including or perhaps especially common law jurisdictions, and then also a generational or historic perspective that it doesn't have to be what it is. So. Um, I think that I have probably talked enough, and I think that I have covered everything except for the cronyism. So let me just tell you, of the 50 faculty members, eight were married couples, eight of those. That's a pretty high uh, degree of what I, I consider nepotism, but that's another reflection of the culture there. It's quite the cozy club where Republicans need not apply. Now, uh, I have not spoken about this case until now. Uh, part of it was I really did just want it to be a straightforward uh, political discrimination. You know, um, I have a meritorious claim. I'd like to simply prevail on the merits. I didn't want it to become some political cause, and I can't stress to you enough that it never was. I needed a job. That's really what this was about. But I stand before you and am now hoping that I can get your attention and your collaboration as we go forward for this trial in June. And part of the reason that I'm doing that is that um, I haven't had any institutional support, despite the suspicions of everybody on the left that I'm a David Horowitz lackey. I'm not. I never had, I don't have any institutional support, and my lawyer has uh, advanced the cost, or his law firm has rather, since the beginning. Uh, he has now departed from that law firm and is a solo practitioner. And the well has run dry. We, uh, we need assistance. So um, I hate to take away from any other worthy cause, because I know there are. But this will end. This will end, and we are on the precipice. We are poised to, I think, come away uh, with the victory. I certainly hope so, viscerally hope so. But even if not, we have a moment, a historic moment, a moment of public import, of a public event, to call the country's attention to the malfeasance of these law schools, illegal in my opinion, and I hope to prove, starting with political discrimination, that people with moral convictions like mine, and uh, you know, I'm not a crackpot. 
I have moral convictions that have been well-reasoned, well-documented, well-thought-through, and I will debate with anyone. I represent, in my moral convictions, millions of Americans who are blacklisted from higher education because our convictions are not politically correct. And that is really the bottom line. So, and this has implications because it's the legal profession from which our judges emerge. I have said that the pro-life, pro-family movement has spent a lot of time watching and fighting over judicial nominations and not nearly enough time looking at the culture that produces the judicial nominees. That culture is what you have seen in this presentation. It's monolithically left of center, monolithically. All the talk about diversity is, is, is a lie. There is tremendous staggering conformity intellectual and political conformity, notwithstanding the incessant talk about diversity. They are cut from one cloth, and it matters. It matters not just for our future judges, but also as a matter of integrity. Um, we cannot have those in our law schools teaching the First Amendment violating it. Thank you. <laughs> so this is This is where, if you are uh, interested to, if you are interested to donate, this is where uh, this is my attorney's contact information. Please contact him, uh, write him, call him, cheer him on. He needs a lot of moral support, and he's done a good job. And it's been, you know, a long, windy road. So um, I would be happy to take questions uh, if anybody has. I don't know what the schedule is for the room or for the building, but I'd be happy to talk with anybody. Oh no! Oh no!